Uh, our final speaker of the session is Dr. Lauren Williams, who's a professor of chemistry and biochemistry at Georgia Tech. So feel free to take it away. So I would like to start, of course, by uh, saying this is just fantastic to celebrate 10 years of the Center for Chemical Evolution, which was, of course, initiated and driven by Nick Hudd. And uh, Nick, of course, is, as many of you know, he's a very good friend of mine, but also uh, Nick scientifically has I can say totally transformed Georgia Tech, um, including my science and the science of a large community of people. And um, uh, I think all of us are very grateful to him for that. So thank you, Nick. Um, also, I guess we should be thanking the NSF and NASA and funding agencies who have um, been very generous with us at Georgia Tech. So in my talk right now, I'm gonna talk about um, the work of my whole group, end of the CCE, end of this other center called the Center of Chemical, uh, Center for the Origin of Life. But in particular, you can see Andrew, sorry, Anton Petrov in the very back here. I'm gonna talk about work from Anton. And then here is Moran uh, Frankel Pinter. Um, I'm gonna be talking about her work and work by Jessica Bowman. Um, those are sort of, I guess, uh, people who have been uh, very instrumental in what I'm gonna talk about, although many people in this group and outside, Jennifer Glass, who's not shown here, is a close collaborator. Of course, Nick Hudd is a close collaborator of mine. Uh, and uh, so I'm probably not gonna really do justice to all my collaborators when I give this talk. Um, so please forgive me. So um, what I'm gonna talk about, I, can't, I don't even know what my title was that I submitted, but what I'm gonna talk about is our attempt to integrate evolutionary theory, the origins of the ribosome, and the origins of life. And try to try to understand what these things, when you mush them all together, what they mean. Um, that's my intent here. And I can't say we're totally successful at this. I don't think we've accomplished it, but we have, I think we have figured out a few things. That's what I'm gonna try to uh, talk to you about. So I wanna start with this bird, this beautiful picture of a bird, and I want you to look at the feathers because these feathers are used to illustrate uh, a really important concept in uh, evolution. And those concepts are the concept of, adapt, of adaptation, which is the tuning of a trait over time, and then exaptation, which is the co-opting of a trait for a new function for which it has not been adapted. And th this concept of exaptation was really developed by Gould, uh, uh, Stephen Jay Gould and uh, Elizabeth Verba in 1982. There's a marvelous paper that I would suggest um, everyone read. And basically the bottom line about feathers is that feathers were initially adapted for thermal regulation, then they were accepted for flight. So when you look at a bird and you think, wow, look at those beautiful feathers, they must have been a engineered from the ground up for flight or something like that, that's not true. Okay, this this uh, adaptation then acceptation um, has to be kind of understood when we think about evolutionary processes. But it's not just evolution. Um, I just actually, right after Tonio's talk, I went and I heated up my coffee in my microwave oven and I took special satisfaction in doing that because my microwave oven, like yours, uses technology that has been accepted from World War II uh, radar technology. And uh, this is in the, there's a large body of literature on sort of technological uh, acceptation. And um, the idea is that you can adapt the technology for one purpose and then you exact it and you use it for a purpose, for a totally different purpose. And this, you know, this is true in, in biology and in, um, in technology, but it's in music, language, architecture, literature. I've been thinking about this, and I, I think that basically for any selective process, anything for which you have selection, you are gonna see acceptation. That, that seems to be the rule. It's not just a biological function. And the question I thought about is why is that? And I think the reason is that it's easier for to steal something than to create it. And actually, uh, Martha talked a little bit about this paper in her talk, this uh, Francis uh, Jacob paper um, in science in 1977, Evolution and Tinkering. And uh, 
Jacob doesn't use this word acceptation in his paper. I think you know this this predates uh, Gould and Verba's sort of in, invention of that term, but you can see it, it kind of works all around it and it and explains um, sort of why, why evolution would be so apt to accept things. It's, it comes clear um, in that paper. I would recommend this uh, evolution and tinkering paper in science in 1977 for anybody who's interested in the origin of life. So uh, I wanna talk about a little bit about the symbolism we have developed for to talk about this. If you look here, you can see uh, when I show a change of shape, a gradual change of shape, that is, uh, that is the represent adaptation and then a more precipitous change in color represents acceptation. So adaptation tunes the trade over time, generally in response to some selective pressure and Acceptation co-ops co or steals or borrows an existing trait for a new function uh, to which it is not adapted. And this process, we've been thinking a lot about this uh, in my lab. And um, one of the, the things we've realized is that this process is recursive. And what, what I mean by that is the product of one cycle is the input for the product of another cycle. And so that's sort of what I'm showing here is that the um, we have these a serial adaptation acceptation process. And what it means is you go somewhere and then you don't go back to the beginning. You leave from the new place and you're always starting um, where you ended the last cycle and going on for there. This is this is the nature of acceptation and adaptation. And I want to give you sort of my favorite example of this, which we have developed in our lab. We've sort of thought this through carefully, which is the mitochondrion. If we think about the evolution of the mitochondrion, it it it, it sort of it, it's some very very good examples about uh, adaptive adaptive recursion. And so we we can start with a a bacterium. This is a ancestor of the uh, of the mitochondrion, and that was highly adapted for wherever it was. And uh, that was accepted uh, to become a symbiont. That symbiont was accepted to become an organelle, energy producing organelle. That organelle was accepted to become a signaling platform. And if you look at uh, mitochondria in sophisticated eukaryotes, the uh, the mitochondrion, you know, directs apoptosis and it controls all sorts of signaling in a cell. So you can see this kind of recursion here. Um, this is this is what I think is the wildest thing. If you look in the eye of a tree shrew, this is this is a fantastic story. You can see that uh, mitochondria have been closely packed to form lenses. Um, and these lenses, you know, they, they're used uh, to inter for interference, to block UV light, and to focus, and to collect light. Um, and there's other, there's actually even, there's some other independent systems where mitochondria have become closely packed to manipulate light in worms and things like this. So this shows you where, how this process, how creative it can be. It can, you know, you go one place, you start where you end and you go again and you go again and uh, and in the end, you're so far away from where you started. So the way we say this, this is how we've kind of tried to articulate it in a general way, which is that acceptive adaptive recursion, it opens new phenotypic landscapes from which it launches new rounds of this recursive process. And one of the things this does is it kind of introduces a fog. It makes it so that, you know, the, the ancestral landscape is not recognizable from, let's say, the extant landscape and vice versa. So what I mean is if you looked at the, we, we have a pretty good idea of the ancestor of a mitochondria, and it's not too much different from an E. coli. If you look at that E. coli, you know, could you predict this mitochondrial lens? No matter how much you knew about that E. coli, the, the answer is no, you could not. And the other way works too. You could study this mitochondrial lens seen in this shrew eye and you could understand everything about it, but you could never backtrack from that alone, from that information you get from the mitochondrial lens to understand the ancestral bacterium. Okay, so that information gets lost. 
And um, it's not that you can't recover that information in other ways, but there is this fog that is introduced by this recursive uh, adaptive exaptive process. Okay, so we just looked through, and I mean, a lot of these are in the literature. There, this, this goes on everywhere in biology. Bone is one of my favorite examples. You know, all of the, all of the bones in your arm are accepted from a fish fin. And so your, your arms are basically accepted fins at some level. And actually the same is true for the wings of a bat and the leg of a horse, just to give you some kind of idea of the creativity of this process. If you look at tRNA, tRNA is, I think, is a really amazing example of this. Um, I mean, we don't know so much about the uh, evolution of tRNA, but the best models are that it started with something I, I'm calling the Schimmel mini helix. Um, that was ultimately accepted to be this translational adapter function of tRNA we all know and love. Uh, but in some systems, of course, tRNA is a translational inhibitor. And then you look in eukaryotic systems and fragments of tRNA are used all over for all sorts of functions. Um, tRNA has been widely, widely accepted. And you can look pretty much everywhere in biology and see this. Actually, GAPDH is near and dear to our heart. Um, it's been widely accepted. And uh, one of our colleagues, of course, Amit Reddy, um, has, I don't know if he's, use the word acceptation in his work, but he has shown that GAPDH has been uh, accepted for heme uh, regulation and heme biosynthesis. So this is a general rule of biology. Pretty much everything you look at in biology has gone through this process. It's just an inescapable part of biology. So what this does is this causes a fog um, because it becomes very difficult to understand ancestry from looking at some extant function. So this is kind of a problem that we need to all uh, accept when we're thinking about the origin of life. So let's ask this other question. What about small molecules? Does this happen to small molecules? And as far as I can know, nobody's actually really specifically asked this question. So Moran and Anton and Kavita and Jennifer Glass and I, we, we thought about this and we looked and we did not have to look far. I mean, think about adenosine. I mean, we don't know the deep, deep history of adenosine. I'm just kind of making up the first steps that it was in an informational polymer that was accepted to a catalytic polymer. But from then on, we know what happened. It was accepted as a second messenger, as enzyme cofactors, and in, in advanced eukaryotes, it's a hormone. So, uh, you know, this small molecule has gone all over biology and is doing all sorts of things. Actually, a great example is citrate. I don't really showing that here, but, you know, citrate, of course, is a, an ancient metabolic uh, small molecule, but it's, it's an important component of bone. And bone is like, you know, in the scale of time we're talking about, bone is like last night, you know, so it's very recent. Um, so, uh, you know, so we know that's a very recent process. So uh, clearly small molecules get accepted and spread all over biology, just like proteins, just like, uh, just like organisms, like the, like the mitochondrion. So, so what we say is that acceptation is really, it works on all scales. It, it, it goes from the, from the largest things in biology, you can think about evolution of bone, you can think about evolution of proteins, and you can think about small molecules also. It transcends scale. And we think it is pretty much unavoidable that this exaptive adaptive recursion was important from the earliest stages of chemical evolution and is, of course, still going on now. So, Okay, so far I've talked about the first part of my talk, which is how we think about evolutionary theory. Now I wanna break that down to think about what does this mean for the evolution of the ribosome? And what does this mean for how we think about the origin of life? So I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail here um, on this part because we have worked out some uh, very detailed models um, on the evolution of the ribosome. And I think these models are 
well-grounded, they're structure-based primarily, um, and they've been published. Um, you know, Anton Petrov um, has taken the lead on this, uh, and um, I'm not going to try to justify these models now. I'm just going to use them, and uh, uh, if you want to talk to me about them later or something like that, we can. It's, this is what it, this is all published, and um, it's out there, but uh, but I'm, I'm not going to try to justify it now. I'm just going to kind of go on with it. So this is what these models show us. They show us, when we're thinking about the ribosome, that the dominant sort of process in the evolution of the ribosome was the development of the exit tunnel. The exit tunnel is the part of the ribosome evolution that is unremitting. It goes from the beginning of the ribosome to the end of the ribosome. So these colors represent the phases of ribosomal evolution, and I'm just going to walk you through and show you the evolution of the exit tunnel. Uh, by the blue, so we have the, this, when I have the light blue and dark blue together, we already have the exit pore. Then when we go to the green phase, the tunnel gets longer. We're looking right in the back side of the tunnel. This is where the polypeptide exits. Uh, the yellow adds to the exit tunnel. The orange adds to the exit tunnel and the red. So every phase of ribosomal evolution is the building of the exit tunnel. And when you think about the ribosome and the evolution of the ribosome, the first thing you should think about is the exit tunnel. That is that seems to be the singular dominant process that drove the exit the, the evolution of the exit tunnel. And at first we were like, why? Why why do we need an exit tunnel? Then we realized that the evolution of the exit tunnel and the evolution of protein folding are concerted. And so I have these color codes, you know, it goes, you can see green, orange, red. When I look at the evolution of protein folding, and we can pull this right out of the ribosome too, we can see that protein folding evolves, that is frozen within the ribosome, and that the evolution of the exit tunnel is concerted with the evolution of protein folding. And really what protein folding does, we can see that the most ancient part of the ribosome, we have what we call IDRs. These are intrinsically disordered regions. That's this green on the left right there. This Then at the next stage of protein evolution, that collapses into what we call a beta hairpin, because it is a beta hairpin. And uh, these beta hairpins are different from most beta hairpins in biology in that they are surrounded by RNA. They're not embedded in protein. These are, these are beta hairpins embedded in RNA, um, not, not in protein. Then the next stage of protein evolution is the collapse of those beta hairpins into these globular structures, very simple topology. And the next phase of protein evolution is uh, what we call evolution of complex folds, which are mixed beta, alpha, and all sorts of complexity. So what does this mean in terms of exaptation and adaptation? How do we understand the ribosome in that way? This is sort of how we, we think what is happening. We believe there was an evolutionary process that produced this intrinsically disordered um, polypeptide, and I'm calling a polypeptide here, but actually going back to Luke's talk, I would say really no, depsipeptide probably. We're, su we're assuming this is depsipeptide, um, the ancestor. We're in the, in the ribosome itself, of course, we're seeing the, the extant version of this, but we think at the ancestral state, this was not polypeptide. It was, and it may have, it may have been a racemate. We don't, I would assume it's a, it's a, uh, depsy, a racemate of depsipeptide. That's sort of our working model. That, structure was exacted to form beta hairpin dimers and beta dimers. That was exacted to form uh, these very primitive globular structures, and that was exacted to form these complex structures. So then you would say, why? What was, what was happening here? And uh, I think this is actually pretty clear from looking at the ribosome. These IDRs on the left, we can see these associate with RNA in a very simple way. In fact, if you go back to Luke Lehman's talk, I mean, I think that's kind of the origin of this. Um, these things bind to a single RNA helix within the ribosome, and we presume they were uh, protecting it from hydrolysis, and they in turn were being protected from hydrolysis. So that would be what drove that. Then that collapsed into 
into beta hairpins. And what we can see in the ribosome is these are different. These, these interact with the RNA in a much more complex way, and they actually nucleate folding of the RNA and bring um, different parts of the RNA structure together. So these may be the driving force was to support RNA function. Then these could collapse into globular domains. And what does that give you? That gives you real enzymes, right? That gives you three-dimensional structures with binding pockets and enzymatic catalysis. That's a whole new world. And um, then what happens next? Then you have cooperativity, allosterism, long-range communication, um, and things that these complex folds will confer. So we can we can under this this acceptation adaptation. Uh, I think really helps us understand uh, the evolution of the ribosome, and we can see what's going on in in the evolution of protein using this formalism. Um, so now I'd like to just step back and say, let's look at biology itself. And this is a David Goodsell image that I really love, and uh, I just love looking at these images. And I put a couple on the bottom right. I put a feather and a microwave here, and the reason I did that is to remind us that when we look at these things, we shouldn't try to infer history from them. Just like you can't look at that microwave and figure out who won World War II, or you can't figure out anything about radar, right? The history gets lost in this acceptation process. And the same goes with the feathers. And I think it's pretty clear that the same goes with pretty much everything here. And um, so, in fact, if you, so what I'm saying is that you know, evolution keeps us in this fog. It's not that we can't fight our way through and we can't like walk through somehow, but we have to be uh, very aware of this fog and we can't try to read too much into to extant structure and function. And in fact, Stephen Gould and Elizabeth Verba recognize this exactly. And in their paper in 1992, they say it. This is before the RNA world you know, uh, the Gilbert paper came out. I think Gilbert should have read this 1992 paper before he proposed his RNA world model, because what he says is, what, what, what Golden Verba say is that any principle in general historic reasoning, nothing is more important than a clear separation between historical basis and current operation. You can't look at RNA and understand very much about its history, that the, that the extant RNA, that's what they're saying. And what we would say, we would say it in a slightly different way, we'd say exaptive adaptive recursion opens new phenotypic space, this is what I already said, and launches new round. And because of that, the ancestral landscape is not recognizable from the extant landscape. So this is something when we think about the origin of life, I think it's always very tempting to look at things in extant biology and try to read deep meaning into it. And I, I think we need to be, very cautious when we do that. Okay, I don't even think I ran over. I, as my ending slide, I would like to remind you all that in 2022, AbSycon is gonna be here at Georgia Tech. Martha Grover is the chair. And um, it's it's a little tentative because we pushed it back because of COVID, but um, please somehow mark on your calendar that the second week in May, um, AbSycon is in Atlanta. In two, uh, 2022. And if you want to come and argue with me about the ribosome, I'll be here. Thank you, guys. Um, and I would like to acknowledge my group for all the help they have done uh, in helping me understand all these things I just talked about. So thank you.